week. Good start. I did it for another minute. Okay. Oh, we're streaming. Mic up. Mic up. Let's go. Hey, everybody. Uh, so welcome to uh, Computer Club's first meeting. Um, so if you haven't looked on the screen already, uh, we do have an attendance um, for the Computer Club meeting today. You do have to be signed in to your DSU email uh, through Gmail um, to be able to sign into that Google form. Uh, so please do that, um, and I'll leave that up there for a second for y'all to look at. All right, everybody got the link? Cool. All right, so um, what do we do in Computer Club? Uh, well, first we'll introduce ourselves, uh, if you don't know us already. Uh, I'm Bailey Belisario, I'm like president, I guess, and it doesn't really matter. Um, I am Jordan Oberg. I'm Peter Ingalls. And Ryan Leister. Cool. Cool. So yeah, um, we tend to cover a lot of projects that aren't covered in any of the other clubs. Um, more just side things, uh, stuff that people like to show off. Um, like Peter is showing off some cool robotic stuff today. So that doesn't fall into any of the other club categories, but does fall into the computer club. Uh, but stuff like that is pretty fun. Um, and yeah, throughout the year, um, feel free to if you have a cool project that you want to show off or something that you've been working on, um, feel free to contact one of us and uh, we'll definitely try to get you in um, if it's like appropriate or whatever, but hopefully it is appropriate. But uh, yeah, so our meeting schedule, um, we will meet when we need to. Uh, we're not going to have a meeting every single week, but uh, some of the meetings that we do, that we will have, um, are going to be speaker based. So we'll have someone come in and talk to y'all about, I don't know, opportunities, especially a lot of job opportunities. Uh, we are gonna have like um, a meeting coming up soon uh, about internships um, and what some people did over the summer and like just opportunities like that for y'all to look for in your future. Um, but if a weekly meeting does come up, it will be in the email that is sent out. And uh, if there is not, someone that didn't get the email uh, this past weekend, uh, let us know at the end of the meeting and we'll get you signed up on the weekly emails. But yeah, so we'll go into our useful resources. So um, our first one is Slack. Um, we'll talk about Slack um, a little bit on the next slide, but uh, Slack is just like a business communication tool. Uh, it is not through the school is just like something we came up with to do um, but it is really useful uh, it's very helpful for students to get involved get connected um, and especially get involved with a, a lot of channels that we have um, our next so, um, yeah if go there's ahead. anybody here that's not in the DSU slack um, it is very highly recommended that you do that if yeah. you go to kernelpoppers.slack.com and make an account with your Trojan's email, um, then you can go join all sorts of stuff. And of course, we'd recommend you join like DevSec, OffSec, Programming Club yep. channels. Yep. But just general information about campus too is like super useful and a yep. lot of really cool learning happens there. Yeah, and it's really fun too because if you have like some channel that you want to create yourself, um, that you have like a certain topic you want to talk about, like I don't know, some people create channels for TV shows or whatever going on and they discuss stuff like that. Uh, and it can also be private channels, uh, public channels, uh, stuff like that. But it's it's really, really useful. Um, I remember I didn't really get into it until around spring my freshman year. And I w regret that. I really wish I would have gotten into it earlier. But um, yeah, definitely recommend that. Next um, is the iLab. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, and on Slack, two of like the most useful channels for me are Marketplace, where DSU students just have like stuff they don't need. I got two really awesome monitors off of Marketplace for a really good price, sort of a thing. Um, 
So it's like our, our local garage sale site or something. And then there's a jobs one where people are literally like, hey, I have a job. I need a student to fill this position. Please contact me. So um, pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's super useful, like we said. Um, next is the iLab. If you have not uh, gotten connected with this yet, um, most likely one of your teachers will teach you how to go through it uh, when it comes up. But uh, one of the coolest features about the IA Lab, um, so the the link for it is iaLab.dsu.learn.ialab.dsu.edu. Learn. Learn. Um, so what's really useful about it is the projects um, side of it. Um, so you can actually go in there and create your own uh, virtual apps yourself. And then inside the V apps, you have your own VMs. So you can create your own little lab environment of testing certain things, uh, depending on what you want to do. Um, of course, like there are some limitations on like some of the resources you can use within those VMs. Like we're not going to allow you to use like 128 gigs of RAM on this VM. So like, you don't really need that. But I mean, it's really useful for projects that you want to work on and that you don't have the resources to use physically, uh, you can do it virtually. Um, our next uh, useful resource is dsuonthehub.com. Uh, so if you haven't heard of this, um, this is a place that you can go to for uh, certain software uh, that you will be able to register your email, your school email, uh, create an account, and then uh, you'll be able to download certain software. Uh, especially useful to us is <coughs> VMware um, products. So VMware, uh, it's just a, um, what is it, technical? Virtualization Hyper software. Yeah, hypervisor. Right. Yeah, so hypervisor um, that you can put on your own uh, computer. And uh, yeah, super useful to create your own local VMs. Uh, especially for like offensive security folks like your Cali or Parrot, one of those. Um, so yeah, and then uh, probably one of the biggest ones we wanted to highlight uh, as well is the next one over the wire bandit labs. So if none of you are really, uh, or you really don't know Linux at all, uh, you're just getting into Linux, um, you've used Windows computers pretty much your whole life. Um, I would really recommend going to Over the Wire Bandit Labs um, and starting with that because it'll teach you the basics of Linux um, and understanding how to connect like over SSH um, and then learning the file structure um, or the file system with Linux and it, all that type of stuff. Um, I'll super. Be doing Linux definitely. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's super useful. Um, and then it also does go into like, Kind of is kind of like a CTF in a way too, because you gotta like get flags uh, sometimes. So that's pretty fun, um, and it progresses from level zero to now I think, uh, at, yeah, level thirty. And I, it does get pretty difficult at some points, like if you really don't know what you're doing. But um, of course, you have resources all over the internet to help. Like, don't go look up the solutions, but uh, definitely try to. Uh, look up how you do certain things in Linux. But uh, next useful resource is uh, JetBrains student account. So do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so JetBrains is an online website. They have a bunch of IDEs for students to use. Uh, you'll find out a lot about it when it comes to time. If you have to take a web app here, uh, you'll learn out about JetBrains pretty quickly because uh, we use PHP Storm as well as WebStorm, uh, which are both JetBrains products. Uh, but as a student here, if you create an account with your DSU email, uh, you get a free access to all of their IDs that they have. They have stuff for Python, C, uh, pretty much any type of development platform that you might need. Um, so if you aren't set up for like any of that kind of stuff, uh, especially for like Windows machines, uh, it's a really good resource to know about. Yeah, it's great for web development stuff. Um. Uh, and then Lucid Chart is our next useful resource. So Lucid Chart, um, you're probably gonna have classes where you need to make flowcharts or just like diagrams in general. And Lucid Chart is a web application that is just like super good at that, and it's free if you're a student. So if you need to make a graph, check it out. I used it for some of this. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the last two uh, is kind of more just like 
general things that might you might not know about. Um, so Amazon Prime, you get 50% off the membership for Prime if you are a student. Um, so I uh, definitely recommend that because Amazon Prime is awesome. Um, definitely way better than like regular shipping and plus you can get tons of deals with Amazon Prime. Um, Spotify uh, is five dollars a month uh, so if you want unlimited music pretty much uh, you get it with Hulu and Showtime as well um, and you just connect that through your Spotify account uh, super easy to do um, but yeah those are some options for you just as a student in general um, so back to Slack uh, we do have some rules um, so Slack accommodates uh, a bunch of different people across like DSU, alumni, um, possible employers, um, and we do have some rules with it. We do require you to be respectful. We do have admins in, in our Slack as well, so um, you're not going to get away with certain things for sure. Um, and then the last on the slide, the last one, uh, keep politics inside of the politics channel. Um, it's just appropriate. Um, but yeah, you can use uh, custom usernames um, and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty much all the general rules. Um, if you have questions about it after the meeting, feel free to come up to us and ask. Um, computer club dues. So, um, so ten dollars is the computer club dues this year, um, and basically you get uh, free travel with competitions and the hotel. For competitions, um, uh, food at mock competitions and whatnot, um, and you can pay that through either cash or Trojan Silver. Um, and we will be taking money after the meeting, so if you have that ready on hand, uh, feel free to come up to us and we'll mark you down. Uh, but yeah, so do make sure you pay your dues because if you want to compete and stuff, or you want to just you know do things that you want to do pretty much with computer club you do need to pay uh, but yeah so that's pretty much uh, that uh, Riley yeah. be so we're gonna be having Riley Johnson come up uh, he's with KDSU he is the tech head and he's gonna be doing a short little presentation for y'all How many freshmen are in here right now? Can you guys raise your hand? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. How many of you went to the career, or of the hands that went up, actually, you know what, in general, how many people went to the activities fair this last Wednesday? I'll say everybody. Awesome, glad to hear it. Okay, if you were there, then you may have seen me. I may have called you over. Uh, I'm really eager to, to spread the glory that is KDSU uh, with other people. It's a really great club. So what is KDSU? KDSU is DSU's premier student-led radio club, our only student-led radio club, only radio club. Uh, we really deal with internet streaming, so through the internet, right? And then beyond that, content creation. So we had some guy come up at the career fair, or sorry, activities fair, and he went, can, would it be, could I do movie reviews? And like, yeah, what the heck, why not? The idea is we want people who want, who are enthusiastic about creating content um, and passionate about what they do. And we're more than happy to give you a platform um, to at least the greater Madison area. But that last part, maintaining radio at KDSU.net is the primary reason why I'm here. So why am I here? Uh, I graduate at the end of the semester. I have work afterwards. I have other things I'm doing. Um, after I leave school, so I won't have time for this. This is something I'm really passionate about, um, something I, I built from the ground up over the last year, 
Um, and it's something I want to continue. I want to see continue to flourish. So I'm looking for someone who is or people who are passionate about tech work, whether that's building computers, maintaining computers, doing server work, doing server maintenance, automation even, and then front end, back end development. That's what I'm looking for. This is kind of the gambit of what, what the tech head does. Tech people, maybe in the future. So is this even relevant to me? Some of you, I saw a lot of hands go up, uh, a lot of you are freshmen. Maybe I would assume that not a lot of you came in with a lot of experience. That's fine. I'm uh, more than happy to teach someone from the ground up about what everything I'm working with is and um, get you set on the right track before the end of the semester. Um, so yeah, these are some stats about the stack, we the development stack um, that I actively work with. It may seem a little daunting, but it's all the JavaScript and TypeScript are same thing, we'll say. Um, but these are some stats. These are why you should care. This is and this is global stats too. So these these numbers are actually never mind, but they're not. Oh yes, it is. Yeah, I have stat. I have uh, global and USA. So <coughs> this is how much you would make in this position standalone. This is the only skill you know, or not the only skill you know, but it's it's one of the primary skills you use, right? So that's kind of what you're looking at up here is um, what your what you would be worth as a developer who is really good at these things. So. Um, as you can imagine, knowing a combination of these things, being skilled in some of them, or just being a good developer in general who can apply a skill or your skills in any way would make you extremely valuable. It really would. So that's why it should be relevant to you. That's the pitch. How do I get in contact? You can email kdsu at dsu.edu. Alternatively, <laughs> You can show up to one of our meetings, and maybe if you like it, you can come back. We meet every Friday, as of right now, every Friday at 1 p.m. in the KDSU booth, which, if you don't know where that is, does everybody know where the, does anybody not know where the game area is? Good. All right. The game, our booth is right next to the game area. Um, there's probably a, uh, a torn apart computer in there. If you look through one of the windows, there's two windows. One of them's a door. It's also a window. Um, and that's where we meet, Fridays at 1 p.m. as of right now. However, in the future, our meeting <coughs> times might change. Some people said that they could not make it, and we want people showing up, right? So in the future, if you do want to attend, check kdsu.net slash about, which I don't have up here, but I can pull up. And that'll have, that'll have the most up-to-date information. So right now, it says, like you'd expect, Friday at 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. And that's give or take. Usually doesn't run that long. But that's a gist of, uh, of the situation. You can also contact me on Slack. I had it pulled up a minute ago. Is the RJ Thurge. Either you can contact me on there if you're interested. If you're not interested, don't contact me. I don't want to talk to you. Um, looking for, again, looking for someone who's passionate, someone who cares about their work, someone who wants, to, or even maybe you don't know. That's fine. Like I said, willing to teach you from the ground up, bring you to the point where you're someone who is not only valuable in this context, but valuable in the marketplace, right? You leave college, you're probably going to want to get a job, most of you. So that's uh, kind of what we're about. <coughs> Can we have any questions? No? Nope. Perfect. All right. Thank you, guys. Alrighty, so that was Riley. So I'm going to go over some really basic Raspberry Pi robotics. My voice is doing okay right now, but I've had a cold for a while, so it might end up giving out a little bit. So just please be patient with me if. Whoa! I just got blue screened. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I usually use Linux. Well, so this was set up wonderfully. Please be patient with me now because of computer issues at computer. Board. Technology. It's never happened to me before.
All right. Were you teaching us how to flu school? Uh, no. But it may have ended up working anyway. All right. So, for those of you wondering, that's my lovely fiance, and I'll pull up the slides again. Cool. All righty. So we're back running. I'm going to have to do a little bit more setup later, but that'll be fine. All right. So, so Raspberry Pi. Does everybody here have a Raspberry Pi? Does anybody here not have a Raspberry Pi? Cool. So just a couple of us. I'm guessing you folks aren't in one of Tom's 150 classes because I think that's like what he does instead of a textbook, right? Because you buy a Raspberry Pi. So these are super awesome, really cheap computers. So I have a Raspberry Pi up here. Um, I'll actually put it on the video so you can see. It might not be that good. Um, so this here, this little board, is a Raspberry Pi. As you can see, it's got... Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, though. All right, switching the camera. So this. <laughs> nice. It's extending, not duplicating. Here we go. Thank you for letting me know. All right, cool. So this is a really bad quality image of a Raspberry Pi. I have better pictures up there. But, um,. So, this machine here has four USB ports. It's got an HDMI output. It takes power in through micro USB. And it also has a network port and an aux out. Um, those of you familiar with Raspberry Pis will know that there's also Pi Minecraft that's generally pre installed too. So, it's its own version, like lightweight <coughs> version of Minecraft. They're super cool. So, if you don't have one, I'd highly recommend getting one. You can get a Raspberry Pi, just the board, brand new for like 35 bucks. Um, you can get a Raspberry Pi kit like this one up here for like 50 bucks that comes with all sorts of cool gizmos and gadgets. If you're interested at all at doing robotics with a Raspberry Pi, I'd highly recommend going with a kit rather than just a Pi um, because it's way more expensive to buy all these little pieces later than it is to buy them all at once. Alright, so the Pi we're using is Raspberry Pi 3B Plus. Right? Um, there are Raspberry Pis fours, but I think they're kind of hard to get your hands on because everybody wants them. Um, got a gigabyte of RAM and a quad-core processor which runs at a really slow clock speed, which is fine because it's meant to draw a little bit of power. Um, so we're going to be using Python 3 because Python 3 is awesome and the Python 3 RPIO library. So first little project that we're doing as far as robotics, just to get kind of the concepts across, is a blinking LED. It's kind of like the hello world of robotics. Um, we're going to look a little bit more at the circuitry. Here's a picture of the way that I have it wired up. I have more wires in here than just that because we've got two projects ready to go. Um, but circuitry. So we've got our red wire right up there going to that row with the plus. So the red wire is sort of carrying uh, a positive charge, if you want to think about it that way. Then we have a blue wire that's going to the ground. So the pin that the red wire is hooked up to on the Raspberry Pi, you can see the pin goes to the Pi, is a GPIO pin, general purpose input output, um, which means it can be on, powering things, or off, or sending a specific signal. But for the purpose of an LED, it's going to be on or off. The blue wire is a ground. Whenever you have an electrical current, you kind of send the power from the positive through whatever you're trying to power to the ground. So you can think about it like water traveling through kind of a trough powering water wheels, right? So you've got your trough, you've got the water flowing this way, and you've got your wheel that's spinning as it's being powered, right? So red is the beginning, blue is the end. Um, the resistor, there's a resistor in here. 
that's to stop the electrical current, like using the water analogy current, um, from going too fast and breaking the wheel. The LED here can only handle a little bit. So let's look at the code. It's really short. It's only 25 lines. Um, so lines 1 through 5, we've got shebang, user, bin, and Python 3. So that's telling the computer, the Raspberry Pi, hey, when you run this program, use Python 3. Then we're importing the RPIO .gp, uh, the GPIO uh, bit of the RPIO library as GPIO. So that means when I say GPIO, it knows what I'm talking about. It's talking about the Python module that's meant to talk with these little pins. It's interesting. So you can install this RPIO um, library, Raspberry Pi input output, on any machine, as far as I'm aware, that's running Python. But it only works if you're using a Raspberry Pi. Which makes sense, because my laptop doesn't have pins. I can just stick a little thing to jig on um, if I want to power things. But another thing that was interesting, I initially tried doing this on a Pi that was running Ubuntu as an operating system, and it didn't like that either. There might have been a way to trick it into doing things, but I decided to just like do it right. Um, so there's that. We're setting up things, importing things from time. Import sleep. Sleep is a function that will make the program stop for a little bit and then keep going. Um, so then we're on line 9. Oh. So 8 is just a print statement. So line 9 is saying, tell GPIO to list all of the pins by their number. So got pin number 1, pin number 2, pin number 3. Can I get the mouse up here? Sweet. I can. So we've got all the different pins. Um, and we're using pin 8 for this. Alrighty, line 12, we're telling the Pi that pin 8 is going to be used for sending a signal. That's what the GPIO dot out is, is sending a signal out, not receiving one in. They can listen as well. Um, and then also setting it initially to a low setting, not sending any power out. It's low. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. So then line 15, we've got a wonderful infinite loop. Those things are really great. So if you're doing this in C, you could do um, a for loop that has like one as the condition, right? Or you could just do like while one is equal to one, sort of a thing. Um, but in Python, it's just while true. Um, so we're going to say print out setting the pin number eight to high, and then tell the pin eight to output a high voltage. So when you say output high, that's just the Raspberry Pi saying, hey, um, I'm going to send 5 volts out of this connection, right? We already set it to be out, and it's going to set it to high. So that will be enough power to turn the LED on. Then we're going to tell it to sleep for a second. Um, that way, you know, it's on, and it's on for a little bit. And then we're going to tell it, hey, set it to low. Um, GPIO.output, we're saying pin 8, go to low. So that will turn the power off. It's very much an on-off switch. So if you think about it like a light switch, when your light switch is up when it's high, your light is on, right? When your light switch is down, it's off, right? It's not like it's sort of going. It's low, but there's something there. It's just off, right? And when it's high, it's all the way on. If you've ever tried to balance a light switch halfway in the middle, you know it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. You might be able to get it stuck there, but the light's not going to be half bright. Um, so then we'll go ahead and try this. I'll get the webcam go and point this at the wonderful LED that's here. This is a really kind of a crummy um, deal. Oh, yeah, I need to set up the Raspberry Pi thing again um, because blue screen. That was great. It's really, it's never happened to me before. A lot of this machine. But that's okay. I found a Linux distro today, Pop OS, that should work already with this laptop. So if we do, this is the same program that we were just looking at. And you can all see that. It's kind of small. Um, here we go. 
So that's exactly the program that we were just looking at. Um, if we run that, you can see if you're up here, or once I get the camera in place, that the light is in fact blinking. So it's actually working. That's really cool. It's always nice when things work. Yes? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I have no idea why it's doing that because <coughs> it's working on my screen. That work? Cool. Before, I had to take it off battery saver mode, but it should already be set to... Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. It's working. Oh, hey, I got to be clicked into it for it to duplicate this on the projector. But it's working on my laptop when I'm not clicked into it. So that's really interesting. All righty. So we're just going to control C out of that. It's not the best way to do it, but it works. Um, and then the light will just stay whatever it's set at because I didn't tell it to like clean up or anything. Cool. So now we're going to do something more fun than just a blinking light. Blinking lights are cool, right? And they're great for getting concepts down. But how do you guys think uh, laser turret sounds? It's not an automatic laser turret. I have to aim it so far. But, you know, automating things isn't that hard. I had it sort of going once last year, but then it was pretty bad. All right, so we've got the laser pointer running. Perfect. So this has different components. It's got servos and a laser, right? So the laser is exactly the same thing as the LED from last time, right? Um, it has two wires that hook up. One of them's power, one of them's ground. This one doesn't need a resistor because the current going through isn't enough to break that sort of wheel. Um, it just makes it dimmer if I put a resistor in there. Um, but servos are different. They have three wires. So they always have power going to them. But that doesn't mean they're always moving, right? Just because there's current going through there doesn't mean that it's doing stuff, right? Like you can have a laptop or um, a vacuum plugged in, but it's not always vacuuming. So looking at how servos work, they have different wires that usually look like one of these three color schemes. The ones that I have are brown, red, and orange. That's just the way that they came from Amazon. Um, so they have a ground and they have a power just exactly the same way as an LED does. But they have an orange one. Um, and the orange one is telling it, hey, where to go? I guess I should explain what a servo is. So a servo is just a little motor. It's got a little head on it. And it'll go whoop or it'll go whoop. It'll point whichever direction you tell it to go. Within 180 degrees for these ones, there are rotational servos that will just spin in a circle forwards or backwards. These ones are positional. They go by degrees. Um, so how are we going to tell it where to go? Um, if you have like an Arduino or something, you can control a servo by just telling it the angle that you want it to go. But with Python, it's not exactly this, that straightforward in a Raspberry Pi. So they're can Controlled by pulse with modulations. Cool. So I need two volunteers. Anybody want to volunteer? Got one? Do you want to be the other volunteer? Cool. So pulse with modulation is sending a series of ones and zeros across the network. Because if you think about it, this is a pin. It's either on or it's off, right? And that's only two values. If we have 180 degrees we need to go, like, we need 180 values, right? Two ain't going to cut it. So, pulse width modulation. Right now, um, this thing is sending pulse width module, like, signals. So, you say one, you say zero, when I point to you. Right now, the signal that's being sent is? One, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Yep, exactly. Zero. Up and down, up and down, exactly like that. Now, if we want to change the direction that it's going, these servos will understand if the speed at which they're told to go changes. So if we have it set to zero degrees, if it's going at a low like frequency of modulation, we'd have one, zero, one, zero. But if we wanted to move it to ninety degrees, we could do one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. 
Yep, exactly. So the frequency at which we send the signals is what tells the servo which direction it needs to go. So if you tell it to go to 90 degrees, this Raspberry Pi is going to be sending 101010 at that speed until you tell the servo to go somewhere else, right? Um, so if you have interference or something that maybe throws a couple ones or zeros in there, it'll kind of spaz out a bit and kind of flicker all over the place. So this is called the dupe cycle. So this doesn't go by degrees the same way that we think of it. Like 90 degrees is halfway between 0 and 180. That would be a 50% duty cycle. 120 degrees would be a 75%, right? It's all just the speed that it's going at, right? Um, so let's look at the code for this one. This one's like 70 lines, which still isn't that bad, right? Um, part one, we have lines one through nine. That's the same sort of setup we did before. We're importing the library. We're um, importing the sleep library, um, or sleep function. Um, and then we're setting up the pins to the output because they're sending signals out. Notice <coughs> this is for the signal pins this time, not the power pins. There's specific pins on a Raspberry Pi dedicated to always sending a signal of just like high out. And since the power for these servos always just needs to be on, right now that's what it's hooked up to. Um, so lines 11 through 20 here, we're setting up the pins to be output. OK, yeah, sorry, I said that. Also, we're setting the pulse width module. Like, we're setting it as a pulse width module thing. Um, like here on line 13, we have this says gpio.pwm. So it's saying, pin 11, you're going to be sending a pulse width module signal. You're not going to be simple the way the LED was, where it's just on or it's off. You're going to be sending frequency, right? Um, same thing with the other one in uh, line 17, right? And then we're starting it at zero. So it's just like sending don't do anything yet signal. Um, so then I have a for loop in here just to do some like automated actions, just like we had a while loop, a while true loop. It just always went. Um, this time I have a for loop that says, go through this five times and move from the bottom end of your spectrum, one, which is like as low as it will go with this sort of syntax, to 12, which is as high as it will go, right? I don't know why the value is one and 12. I think it's fairly arbitrary. It just has to be somewhere within that range. And the direction that these servos will be facing corresponds with that value. Um, we always need a sleep after we have a servo, um, after we have a servo move. Because otherwise, this Raspberry Pi, even though it's not the most powerful computer, is way faster than the servo is at moving, right? So if we tell it, move all the way here, and then, like, less than a second later, we're telling it, move all the way over here, it's just going to be doing a little back and forth so fast that we can't even see it, if it does anything at all, right? And then at the end of the for loop, I just have it saying, go to the middle, go to six, that's the middle. And then I've got some variables there to just keep track of it. Code part two is where the fun part comes in. This is why we can control it, right? So you guys know, like, if states, mints, and everything, right? If this equals this, do this. So I have a while loop that goes forever, or until I type exit in this instance, where it takes an input. It says, hey, do you want to go left, right, up, or down? And I understand that it's kind of lame to have to type left to want it to go left. Like, using arrow keys would be way better. But for the sake of the robotics part, like, it still makes sense. Um, and then, of course, it does a little bit of checking to make sure that it's actually not as far left as it needs to go, right? Um, same sort of thing for going right, going down, and going up, right? Um, and then if I type exit, it exits, right? And it cleans everything up. Um, so at the very, very bottom is where it changes the duty cycle that we talked about to go to the value that we've changed a little bit, saying whether it was left or right or everything. Cool. So let's test how this works. Um, this one's pretty neat. Um, shouldn't need, really, to try using the better webcam. And just pointing it up there. All right, so if we do 
um, cool. Do you see where the laser pointer is? Cool. So if I go left, if I want it to go left, I type left, oops, left. I want it to do it again, type it again. Um, if we want it up, up, down, down. If I just type like nothing, it says, hey, that's nothing. Um, and if I try to go too far up, it's like, hey, that's 180 degrees. I don't go any higher up than right there. Um, so yeah, there are obviously better ways to implement this. Um, there's sort of automation that we can do, right? Uh, we could have it seeking a certain target or something that's moving. There's the little LED again. Oh wait, you can't see that. It's only on my screen. Gosh dang. Um, but that's okay. Um, but yeah. It's pretty fun. And this sort of thing is something that if you buy like a $50 kit on Amazon, right? Like all you need is a Raspberry Pi and like a keyboard and a mouse and like a monitor to plug it into. And then you can do this sort of thing if you have the cables, right? Um, it's really easy to get going. Any questions about anything? Cool. Would anybody here at all be interested in more robotics stuff? Like things that actually are using the webcam for not just like showing it on the screen? Cool. So like you all seen the Michael Reeves like laser pointer in your eye, right? So I'm not going to recommend Michael Reeves because he swears and I don't want to misrepresent the university, right? Um, but he and William Osmond work together on a lot of cool robotics projects things. So if you're interested in that too, you can get ideas from them as well. Um, I'm using a Raspberry Pi here because like practically everybody here has a Raspberry Pi. Um, but like Arduinos are what most people would use and they're like way cheaper than Raspberry Pis. It's cheaper to use something that you already have than it is to buy something else, like, every time. Um, but yeah, so if you're interested in more, I can work at doing more. I don't think we have anything else. Yeah. So, um, if y'all do have dues, please make sure you come up here, um, and I'll be sitting right here taking notes. Um, but besides that, uh, are there any questions overall? Anyone? Looks like everyone's ready to go. Yeah. What was the email list? You can just come up with me. Yeah. I'll put it at the front again. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.